I want to talk to you about being planted, pruned, and producing. If you got a Bible, go to Psalm 92, verse 12. The righteous flourish like the palm tree. They grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Now, we don't have palm trees in Oklahoma, but palm trees in the coastal states, when there's a hurricane, even if it's like 60, 80, 100 miles an hour, these palm trees, they will sway. They'll look like they're gonna bend, like they're gonna break. They'll go even all the way down to the ground, but then they will stand back up after the hurricane because they are planted and they are strong and they cannot break even with hurricane winds. This is what God is saying is those who are planted in the house of the Lord, those who are righteous, they will flourish like palm trees. They will flourish. They will grow strong like cedars in Lebanon. Cedars in Lebanon are stable trees, strong trees. God wants his church to be strong, to be stable, to be unbreakable, to be ready for storms and ready to not bend or break, but to be able to be flexible in those moments and to be able to withstand whatever the enemy brings. Psalm 92 verse 13 says, they that are planted in the house of the Lord. Where? Where? in the house of the Lord. Where? The house of the Lord. (laughs) See, here's the point. David was saying, if you're going to prosper, you got to be planted, and you can't just be planted anywhere. You can't just be planted in a book club. You can't just be planted in school or planted in some good friendships. You got to be planted in God's house. There's no escaping. If you want to flourish this year, it has to happen in the house of the Lord. David says, this is, where, this is where the power comes. This is where the productivity comes. This is where the flourishing happens. It's in the courts of our God. I've never met someone who walked away from church, walked away from God, walked away from being in the house of the Lord that went on to live a flourishing life. There was always, you know, I've ran into people who say, man, I used to be in church 10 years ago, but I just, I don't know. I just got hurt. I got angry. And I'll ask, how you been doing since you left? Well, you know, I got business, I got time, I got stuff, I got you know, stuff going on. And here's the point. When we leave God's house, when we think I can do this without God's people, without God's house, without God's presence, we might be able to succeed a little bit, but eventually our lives start to crumble. Our lives start to face storms, and then we start looking, I gotta get back to that lighthouse. I gotta get back to that refuge. What if we stayed planted all year long in God's house? What would happen if you really allowed yourself to be planted this year in the house of God? Here's what happens in verse 14. They that stay planted in the house of the Lord, not just for one year, two years, three years, if they stay planted long enough, it says they will bear fruit, everybody say fruit, So this is where the producing happens. They will bear fruit even in their old age. Even, come on, somebody needed that right there. Even as you get older, you'll be full of sap, you'll be green. Turn to someone next to you and say, I'm still green. I'm still green. That means I'm young, I'm fresh, I'm thriving. Let's define the word flourish for a moment. Let's define the word flourish. Flourish means to bloom, to blossom, to succeed, to get ahead, to do well. How many of y'all want to flourish this year, right? So if I want to succeed, if I want to do well, if I want to bloom, if I want to blossom, if I want to develop into a healthy, vigorous, uh, youthful energy, it, it comes from being planted in God's house. He says those that are planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish, they will prosper, they will thrive, they will grow luxuriantly, they will reach heights of development influence. You can't hide someone who's flourishing. You can't fake it. You just go, man, it's like there is something about that family. Like they are just doing well. They are strong. They've been able to handle storms. It's not that they haven't walked through pain, but for some reason that family is just, they're flourishing. What's their key? What's the secret to that businessman's flourishing company, the flourishing effect on that marriage? What is their secret? David says, it's those that are planted in the house of the Lord. Those that are planted. I want to go to one more passage. Let's go to John 15, verse 1. And uh, while you're turning there, if you ever watched any of the royal weddings or um, the last year, even the funeral of the Queen of England, There's a place called Hampton Court. It's in the United Kingdom. And it's a famous area where the royal family often goes and visits and and has their uh, houses. And in the Hampton Court, there's a grapevine that's reported to be the oldest living vine in the world. 
It's over 2,500 years old. So right now we're in 2023 AD. This was around before Jesus walked the earth. Jesus, you know, obviously we know he, he died in 33 AD, rose from the grave. But before Jesus was here, there were prophets like Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, uh, Zephaniah, Malachi. And during those hundreds of years before Jesus came, this vine began to grow. Today, it's 2,500 years old. This grapevine, which has one root, is 12 feet around at the start of the root. The branches are over 120 feet long. And despite the age of this vine, it still produces to this day 500 to 700 bunches of grapes, weighing up to 705 pounds every year. Although some of these branches are 120 feet from the main root, they still bear sweet and delicious fruit because they're connected to the vine. So look in John 15, verse 1, Jesus says, I am the vine. I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Now, your version might say, my father is the gardener. My father is the gardener. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and my father, my dad, is the gardener. Every branch, in verse 2, that does not bear fruit, what does he do? What's he do? And we're going, hold up. Like, that, that was my job, God. <laughs> yeah, that was, what do you mean it's not bearing fruit? That's where I worked. And Jesus says, everything that's becoming unnecessary in your life, everything that's not producing the fruit that I want you to produce this year, I'm cutting away. And every branch that does bear fruit, what does he do? He prunes. And we're going, hold up, hold up. That was actually producing fruit. Like, that was going somewhere. I was going somewhere with that person. I, things were going good, and God goes, I know, no, I know. But I want you to produce more fruit this year. Everybody say planted, pruned, and producing. So Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and every branch that doesn't produce fruit, the gardener's coming in. And who's the gardener? God. He says, my father is the gardener, and he's pruning and he's cutting away things that no longer bear fruit or things that do bear fruit that he wants to produce even more fruit. If God's doing something in your life, it means you must be planted in some good soil. If you're walking through some pruning or some cutting or 2022 felt like a pruning year for you, get ready because the producing is about to begin in 2023. If you've been planted and you've been pruned, your bamboo season of producing great growth is about to happen. But some of you right now, you're in this season. And you go, my goodness. My goodness, God, like, what? what? Why did I walk through that? Why was that disappointment? What was that all about? I remember being at my mom's house once and she had hired a, a person to come over and work on her trees and all of her bushes in the backyard. And, and so this guy comes out, he's a gardener and he's got these big shears and then he's got these little clippers like this. And this guy just starts whacking away, just starts slashing her trees. And I'm going, mom, what is this guy doing? And she's like, he knows what he's doing. And I'm going out there and I'm, I'm like folding my arms. I'm like, you do not like, I'm a tree lover. I'm a tree guy. I'm like, you are killing her trees. This guy's like Edward Scissorhands just coming out here and just hacking away her evergreens. She's got some really good evergreens in her backyard. This was back in, like, 2018. And I remember watching him do this, and I'm like, surely he's going to stop. Like, that's a good-looking branch. That is a branch that's produced a lot of fruit. And he's like, oh, that branch looks good. That branch produced a lot of fruit. I'm going, stop, what are you doing? That's a good branch. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it can produce even more if I prune it. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he said, see, see, trees that don't go through pruning, they don't end up producing what they're capable of producing. The pruning is preparation for the producing. The pruning is preparation for the promotion. If you're waiting for, for notes to take in the sermon, I'm hitting you with something right now to chew on for this whole year. The pruning you've walked through is preparation for promotion. 
God says, there's a reason you walked through that loss. It's because I'm delivering you from some things that could have happened if you stayed connected to that relationship. There's a reason why things didn't work out. There's a reason why you might have lost that job. God says, I've got something even greater. And God says, by the way, um, you've allowed some attitudes in your life that are toxic. You've accepted your personality and all the things with it as if that's the way that I made you and, and that you can't change and that you're stuck with these addictions. And this year I'm pruning some of that. And I'm going to show you that you have the power to change. And I want you to get in a connect group this year. And I want you to stop living in isolation this year. And I want you to get ready because this is your growing year. This is your year to let go of trying to do things on your own. You're like, this is starting to look really rough, Paul. Like, please stop doing this. This is looking like my life. At least let me keep my wife and my dog. Like, don't take away PJ and Murphy and Freckles. I'm not saying God's taking people out of your life or that their death was God's doing. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is God teaches us to trust him. God teaches us that we're not in control of everything. If there's one thing I learned in 2020 is that I'm not in control. (laughs) And and I've got to learn to trust God. I can handle what I'm supposed to do, but I can't control what our government does, what other people do. And that during these times of pruning, during these times where God's, he's shaping my character. He's saying there's some character deficiencies here, Paul. And if you'll trust me, I'm going to produce so much fruit in you. You're about to step into your greatest year of growth on the other side of this pruning, but you got to stay connected to the vine because this is where, this is where the fruit happens. Watch what he says in verse four of John 15. He says, abide in me and I in you. I'm going to stick this guy right here for right now. Y'all are like, please give that guy a break. Don't hurt him anymore. Job, don't hurt Job anymore. That's what we'll call him. Naked I came into this earth and Naked I shall leave. He's still got some green on him. Everybody say abide. Abide. Jesus says remain, abide, stay with me, stay in my presence, stay in my word, stay connected to me, abide in me. I used to think that meant I had to be in church all day, every day, 24-7, that to be planted in the house of the Lord meant that I wasn't allowed to go to school or play basketball or go see the movies or hang out or have friends, that I just had to like be in, like, I got to abide and remain, and my dad helped me because I was feeling so guilty and legalistic all the time, and my dad said, no, 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 it doesn't mean that. It means that every day you have an acknowledgement, a God awareness, that you are aware that God's presence is real in your life, that you have a fear of the Lord, not that you're afraid of God, but you have such a reverence for God that when you miss it, when you think a thought you shouldn't have thought, when you say a word you shouldn't have said, when you, when you sin, when you, that you have such an, a God conscious, a God awareness, a, a Holy Spirit conviction that you go, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. God, help me with my temper right now. I'm getting frustrated. I'm getting angry. I'm tempted to gossip right now. I just sat in a conversation that was slanderous. I should have pulled out. And and when you have a God awareness, you're abiding in him. You're changing. You're molding. You're allowing him to prune. You're allowing him to cut some things. You're allowing him to snip and to convict. Y'all are like, no, 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 no more snipping. But he says, abide in me and let me abide in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. This branch cannot produce fruit on its own unless it abides in him, unless it stays planted in the house of the Lord, in the soil of the Lord, in his presence. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Let me get this guy stuck in there. There we go. And then he says this, I'm the vine, verse five, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Everybody say much fruit. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But with me, you can do so much. Fruit. You can produce so much fruit in your life. If anyone, verse six, does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch that withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. That doesn't sound good. But he says, if you abide in me, if you get planted in me, if you let my words get rooted deep into your life, if you let the presence of God have its work in your life, Let's get this thing really planted in here. Okay, if you really let this thing grow, this thing can produce so much fruit. And he says, you will ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But that kind of faith and that kind of power and authority only comes from someone who's planted in the house of the Lord. 
right? That's where it comes from. And so here's, here's what I wanna just challenge you with this year is that you would decide to get planted in God's house and get planted in God's word and allow him to start developing you into who he's called you to be. See, the Bible says that it's, it's almost like massive trees that can grow in his house, cedars of Lebanon. We're talking like the redwood forest, that when we get planted in his house, we begin to flourish, we begin to prosper, we begin to pray better, we begin to trust better, we begin to pull other people into the house, we begin to produce much fruit, fruit of the Holy Spirit, we grow and mature into who God's called us to be. But what stops us from flourishing? What stops us from producing that fruit? I was looking up on a tree website. I'm a tree nerd. And I was looking up at all these websites. What kills trees? What stops trees from growing? And I found a lot of reasons, but there were seven that were very connected to the scriptures about what God has to say about plants, trees, vines, and 2023, and you and me. So I want to give you real quickly seven ways, seven reasons that trees, that believers stop flourishing. Number one, they don't allow themselves to get pruned. Where there's no pruning, there's no producing. Where there's no cutting, there's no producing. When I walk through loss, when I walk through difficulty, when I walk through painful seasons, God says, I'm working in you. I'm growing you. I'm preparing you for who I've called you to be. And it's not gonna be easy this year. But I promise you, if you trust me with the pruning, See, I was watching this guy as he started pruning. By the way, this man in my mom's backyard, he kept on pruning until the tree looked like this. And I was like, I'm going to hurt you. I loved that tree. I was like, you just, you just broke my heart. And I was like, mom, that tree's never growing again. Well, if I could show you a picture, that tree's massive. It's grown, it's produced so many more branches. It's green, it's evergreen, it's strong. The man knew what he was doing. The tree was growing in an odd direction and in order to get it growing full and, and uh, flush and green and lush with you know, all the right branches and looking like a nice oval shape, he had to prune it and get it cut back to the right stem and the right level and the right straightness for it to look as beautiful as it does today. See, the gardener knows what he's doing. Trees that refuse to be pruned will never grow into the mature believer that they're called to be. And if I'll trust that the gardener knows what he's doing, that he's pruning me to produce even more fruit, that he's pruning, he's shaping my character, he's working on me, he's doing a fresh work. He's helping me to get green again. He's helping me to get humble again. He's helping me to learn how to trust him with loss. I remember one time my dad said, Paul, it's good when things don't go your way. And I was like, what? He's like, it's good when you lose. You need to receive the difficulties. I remember I tried out for our our church worship band and I didn't make it. And I went to my dad. I was like, dad, I tried out for your church worship band and your church didn't let me on the team. He's like, my church is your church. I was like, well, our church didn't let me on. He was like, well, that's okay. He's like, you could keep worshiping. I was like, but I want to be on the stage. I want to play guitar. And he's like, well, Paul, he's like, you know, honestly, wanting to be on the stage is probably the wrong reason to be leading worship. He said, it's good that you didn't make it. I was like, well, can't we just fire the worship pastor for not letting me on? He was like, your sister, Ruthie? No, we're not going to fire her. He's like, you want me to call her and tell her you said that? I was like, no, don't tell her I said that. I was like, I love Ruthie, but she didn't let me on the team. He said, well, try out again in a couple months. Keep practicing. Keep practicing. Keep practicing. We got to teach our kids that it's not always going to go their way. Because we're growing up with a generation that wants a trophy and wants to get everything all the time their way. And when you don't get it your way, you start to throw a fit. And you get angry and you get rebellious and you get frustrated. And, and then, and, and if I don't prune, if I don't prune attitudes, for instance, um, one of our kids talked back to their mom a couple weeks ago. And there was a part of me that was so tired that I wasn't going to deal with it. But I felt the Lord say, if you don't prune this attitude now, you're going to have to deal with it when he's in prison, when he's 19. We're growing up with a society of kids who've not been taught how to respect elders in authority 
because there's no father in the house to really correct, or if the father's there, he's too tired to correct. And this may not be a fun message. Y'all are like, wow, you're really coming for me. But if I don't, if we don't, then what kind of fruit are we developing our children to produce? And so I sat him down. I said, don't you ever talk back to your mother like that. And we, you don't disrespect your mom like that. Because I was taught by my dad. My dad was, you know, he was like, don't you ever disrespect your mom. What was he doing? He was clipping off some attitude issues, some lack of respect for authority. And we've got we've to receive the pruning of God. It's for our promotion. It's for us to produce even greater fruit. Whatever it is that we would say, Lord, work in me. Do what you need to do. Cut things that you, if there's things, here's the second reason why trees stop flourishing and growing in believers is pests. Pests. The, 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 one of the biggest reasons why trees and vegetation don't grow is because the locusts, the little foxes, the pests. Locusts will have a, a serotonin change in their brain. They'll go from just being a normal locust to like, ah, like attack. And they'll start attacking and they'll swarm anything that's green and they'll rip off leaves and trees. This is happening in India where they'll come on farmers' lands. This is happening in North America. They'll come across farmers' lands and they'll just rip through the field and steal all the vegetation. Rip through it. Swarming groups of gossip. Swarming locust of negativity. Swarming locust of complaining. Well, I didn't get what I want. Well, welcome to the club. None of us do all the time. But here's what happens. When I allow a pest mentality to sit in my house, it begins stripping all the green growth that God's trying to produce in my life. One of the biggest reasons why trees don't grow and they don't flourish is because these pests will suck the life out of the tree. They will suck the life out of the marriage, suck the life out of the family. This negative mindset, this slanderous mindset, this unbelieving minds, this, uh, this constant, I'm, I'm just angry, I'm frustrated. All right, I'm going to move on. The third reason why trees don't grow and believers don't grow is canker worms. You didn't know you were going to get a tree lesson at church today, but it connects to a believer's lesson too. Canker worms, they're caterpillars that, that get on trees, and then these caterpillars, they turn into, you know, they'll, they'll start out as moths, and then they're caterpillars, and then they suck, and they begin to weaken the bark of the tree. And, and the more caterpillars that grow on the tree, that get on the tree, they begin to draw even more attacks. And the more that they begin to drill holes, they begin to pull out all the life. They weaken the bark. They go for the trunk. They go for the father of the house. They go for the family in the house. And canker worms, I think spiritually, refer to bitterness. It refers to this internal bitterness, this anger at God, at people, and this frustration with, I'm not getting what I want to get. I was talking with Bill Johnson, one of our speakers this last week, or at, at the conference, and I said, what's the key to really living a powerful, fruitful, productive life as a pastor? You've been leading Bethel, and, and you've, you've built this great ministry and family, and he said, I take communion every week, and he said, I pray for my enemies. I pray for those who curse me. I pray for those who speak ill against me. And he said, I got a lot of people who hate me on social media. And he said, instead of cursing them, I pray for them. Because he said, I don't want that bitterness robbing me of the blessing. What's he doing? He's pulling off the canker worms. I had to do this for one of my trees. I had planted a, a river birch tree and these caterpillars had gotten on the tree and I didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, sweet caterpillars, you know. And then I realized they were canker worms and my leaves started having holes in them. Then I stopped having leaves and my tree was bare during spring season. It makes sense to have a bare tree in the winter if it's a, if it's a tree like that. But during the spring season, when you're supposed to see growth, I was seeing holes and I was seeing brown leaves and I was seeing it, it, it decay and die. And I, I called a tree expert and he said, you got canker worms. I said, well, how do I get rid of them? Do I just spray something? He said, you're gonna have to pick them off. So I went out there with no gloves, which just my fingers, and I began to pull these canker worms off the tree, and some of them were slimy too. And as I was pulling them off, I realized this is what it takes in relationships sometimes. This is what it takes when you're down at the altar. God's pulling off some canker worms that have gotten on you. 
This is what it takes as we're parenting our children. We're pulling off canker worms off their mind that they picked up at school, that they're picking up from other relationships, that they picked up from watching that TV show of, of these kids that just do whatever they want to do. I'm, I'm pulling off these things that have been sucking the life out of my kids' development. And I'm going, hold on, I want you to mature this year. I want you to thrive this year. I want you to flourish this year. And when I take communion, I'm saying, Lord, pull off any bitterness that's got inside of me. Lord, I pray for those who've cursed me. I pray for those who've hurt me. Lord, my Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me today my daily bread. And Lord, forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who've sinned against me. What am I doing? I'm pulling off the canker worms. The fourth reason why trees don't grow, and I want the keys to come out, why believers don't grow is too much sun. Too much sun. Now that might sound different because you're going, don't we need sun? But too much sun can scorch a tree. If all a year holds is just 365 days of sun, that tree dies from drought. We actually do better when we have storms here in Oklahoma. Our land produces more crops when we get a good thunderstorm in our city. Now, this will change your mind about storms in your life. Oftentimes, we hate storms. We go, Lord, just give me 365 perfect days this year where I don't experience any setbacks and I don't look behind my back to see if someone's gonna kill me again this year. Lord, I just pray. Have you ever walked through a really good season and you're like, when's it gonna happen? You know what I'm saying? Because you've had so many bad seasons and you're like, where is it? Where's the storm? It's brewing somewhere. You know what I'm talking about? 10 of us in the room have lived this life. The rest of y'all just have perfect days. But if you walk through a storm, it's actually for your good. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. David learned how to run to the shelter in the storms. He learned how to lean into the character development, the growth, the flourishing life. It was connected that in those days when it's rainy and it's stormy and it's gloomy and there's not a sun shining out there. I remember I tried out for that youth worship band four times, never made it. And Ruthie, my sister, she said, I got a position for you. I said, where? And she goes, connect group leader for 9 a.m. children's church service. You're gonna lead worship for about 12 kids. And I remember they would throw Starburst into my guitar hole and Twizzlers. I don't even know how the Twizzlers got in there. Y'all know the hole in the guitar. You're like, what is a guitar hole? It's, it's just a normal guitar with the hole. Anyways, um, <laughs> I remember serving as a janitor during that season. And, and I remember picking up nachos at ORU. I remember working as a camp counselor here and at other places. And I remember just days... Um, I remember just some disappointments happening during that time. And it wasn't just the pruning. It was, it, was part of, it was part of this next reason. Number five, that's not enough water. The fifth reason why trees don't grow or believers don't produce much fruit is they're not getting enough water. The Bible says that rain falls on the just and the unjust. And there's something about allowing God not just to prune you, but to come and say, you know that disappointment, Paul? You know that, that loss of the friendship and that situation that was just so difficult? God says, that's for your good. After Job prayed for his friends, he, he got blessed double for his trouble. God says, if you'll, if you'll drink in the rain that often falls on the land. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 7 says, land that drinks in the rain. Soil that learns how to turn pain and problems and circumstances into part of the growing season. He says, you'll produce a harvest. You'll have a bamboo season. You'll get ready. 2023 is going to be your highest year of spiritual growth and productivity. Those who sow in tears will reap a harvest of joy. But we need water. The Bible refers to water as circumstances, difficulties, trials. But the Bible also refers to water as the Holy Spirit. Rivers of living water will grow up on the inside of people who are born again. It's the flow of the Holy Spirit. I remember Bill Winston coming and preaching a message here called flow. Everybody say flow. And he talked about how all the different analogies in the Bible about water. But one of the other analogies of water in the Bible is generosity. That if I flow with generosity, if I break the dam up, 
Some of y'all just got your attention. You thought I cussed. I'm not saying dam like that, but the dam that, that holds the water in. When you're dammed up with a stingy spirit, oh, Paul, I've just been hurt so much. When you're dammed up with a, a, a wall in relationships, I just can't trust anybody. I just, I got nothing to give. I'm just, I, don't ask me to get in a connect group. This is, I just, I've been through too much. But if you'll allow the flow, everybody say flow. If you'll allow the flow of generosity, not just in your finances, but your encouragement, your love, your time, your energy. God knows if he, if, he, if he can get it to someone who's flowing. See, the dammed up water is like the Dead Sea. Nothing grows. No vegetation can grow in the Dead Sea. It's, it's completely dormant. It's closed. It's dead. But the Jordan River, it's got to flow. It's got to flow. It's going somewhere. And if I live with open hands and say, Lord, I got a paycheck this week. What should I do with it? God says, just give me 10%. Trust me. Trust me with this. And just this week, look to bless somebody. When you're out to eat, just get somebody's coffee. But God, I need that money. God says, just trust me. When you see a homeless person over there, just ask them if they need a burger. If you live with generosity, if, if you're willing during those moments that you're prompted to be a giver, I promise you, you'll never run out. If you live like the, the flow of the Jordan River, see, there is a flow that comes with that water. The sixth reason why trees don't grow, why believers don't grow is bad soil conditions. Jesus talked in Mark chapter four about the different soils and he said there was seed that went out to, to be sowed and, and the first place that the seed fell was the hard path. It was so tightly packed that the seed couldn't even get in. That It was so cold, it was so hard, it was so tight, it was like clay soil. You just can't produce many trees there. It's so thick and it's not it's not soft, it's not moldable, it's not open to receive. And I remember hearing that first parable about Jesus and thinking the soil was about the sermon or that it was about the church I was in. Like, I just need to find a good church so that way I can produce a great harvest. But the soil is not the church. The soil is not the state you live in. Like, maybe you need to move to California. Maybe you need to move to Florida. Maybe you need to move to Texas. Maybe you need to move to Montana. Maybe you need to move to, I don't know, China. And then, and then you'll produce much fruit. But the soil doesn't represent something external. The soil is your heart. Jesus said the sower went out to sow seed. Who's the sower? It's the preacher. It's the word. And he said, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Do, do not trust in your riches. Don't store up treasures here on this earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus says, that's the seed. It's going out. And all these things will be added unto you. And it falls on someone who's sitting in church, but they've got a hard heart. And the Bible says that the birds came and they ate up the seed in Mark chapter four, verse five and six. And then the next soil was the rocky soil. The reasons why trees don't grow is, is they got bad soil conditions. And he said that the seed falls on rocky soil. It's shallow. There's a little bit of belief in God, but there's just so many things in their life that's choking it out. There's just so many, they're just busy and they're hurt and they're, they're going through things and there's trials and they're trying to receive it, but it's hard, Paul. They're, they, they're listening to your sermon right now, but it's like they got five other apps open on their phone and they're just not fully receiving this word. And so it grows a little bit, but then it dies really fast because there's not enough, so there's not a theology to understand that circumstances and problems and pain are all part of God's preparation for you to produce much fruit. God's not the author of your father's cancer, but he is the refuge to run to when you're walking through trials and tribulations. You don't run from God when you hit a storm in life. You run to God. But shallow soil has no theology for pain. Shallow soil says, I'm supposed to prosper every single day and never experience a bad day in my life. But deep, thick soil, good soil says, no matter what comes, my house is built on the rock. He says, then there's thorny soil. The thorny soil, it's, it's, it's obsessed with the pleasures of life. It's choked out by the cares of life. I just, Paul, I got to get out of here. I got to see who's going to win the Super Bowl. It matters more to me than whatever you're going to preach. And I got to know what's going here. And then I got to watch sports. And I, I just got so much going on. We got tournaments. Don't expect to see us in church, but maybe once a year. And, and don't expect us to be like really plugged in here because we just got so much. But the thorns are choking out the growth. Then he says there's good soil. He says it's, it's soil, it's, it's, it's deep, it's rich, it's got all the right ingredients. It's gone through trials and storms and it's experienced pain and setbacks and, and yet it's connected to the vine. It's here that this little stem is about to produce much growth. My hands are a mess here. But he says, get 
the soil of your heart fertile for miracles this year. If you've walked through pain and setbacks, if you've allowed your theology to be shaped by your experience instead of allowing the word to override your experience and say, he's still on the throne. He's still good. My redeemer still lives, Job said. Job's wife said, curse God and die. Job's friend said, you must have something wrong with you. Satan said, I'm coming for Job. God says, you don't know, you don't know the soil of Job's heart. He's going to worship even when he's walking through difficulties. He's going to pray. He's going to trust me even when life doesn't make sense. And when the whole book is done, you watch because Job's going to get double for his trouble. He's about to grow and produce much fruit. The seventh reason why trees don't grow, why people don't grow, is no fertilizer. This is the last point right here. Fertilizer (laughs) is the poop that life brings that produces the harvest God wants to give you. Sometimes you just go through some cruddy moments. But Joseph said, what the enemy meant for harm, what the enemy meant for harm on my life, God used it as fertilizer. See, Joseph got to live 80 years enjoying the harvest of a relationship with God. He spent a couple years in prison accused of crimes he didn't commit, misunderstood, rejected by brothers, hurt, lonely. But that was all before he turned 33. Some of y'all are getting ready to step into your resurrection year. You're about to step into your bamboo seed. You're about to step into your producing. Would you stand your feet all over this place? The last picture I want to show you is the picture of the Redwood Forest, if we have it behind me, because this, this picture really connects with one of our main things this year, and that's to get connected. The redwood forest is the largest trees in all of North America, possibly in the world. These trees are massive, they're strong, but what few people know, not very many people, is that these trees get stronger because their roots beneath the soil are connected to each other. They actually feed off each other's energy. So each tree is not strong on its own, it's strong because it's connected. I believe victory is gonna be a redwood forest. I believe it already is. This church has been around for 42 years and I'm looking at some massive redwood trees in the room. My mom is one of them. See, physically she looks like she's five foot two, but spiritually, if you could see Sharon Darty through spiritual eyes, she's 180 feet tall. She's a redwood forest tree over there. Grand, grand, I rue. She's a sycamore tree planted in the house of the Lord. Jared, he's a bald cypress over there, looking good. Ty Barker, he's a river birch tree. He's 75 feet tall, planted by the Arkansas River. Debbie, she's a red maple tree, 60 feet tall. See, some of us, were just looking at each other and we go, well, I'm just, I don't know, I just, I'm not that. You've been planted in the house of the Lord. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of their God. There's a reason you haven't been broken. You're like a palm tree. You've, you've walked through hurricane winds in your life. The enemy tried to take you out, but you've stayed firmly planted in the house of the Lord, and you're about to produce much fruit. Ashley, she's like 100 feet tall spiritually. Physically, she's about five, feet, five foot one or two, but spiritually, she is a giant in God's house. What makes believers strong is not what we look like on the outside. It's that internal, Lord, I trust in you. God, I trust you through the pruning. Lord, I thank you that you're pulling off all the canker worms, the bitterness towards people that hurt me. Lord, I thank you that I can forgive those who hurt me. Lord, I'm gonna pray for those who, God, I thank you, Lord, I can trust you through the loss, through the grief. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're restoring double for the trouble that I've walked through. God, I thank you, Lord, what the locust has tried to destroy in my life. You're getting ready to restore. He's getting ready to restore. This is a year, 2023 is your year of victory. It's your year to produce great fruit. But apart from him, you can do nothing. This is a year to be firmly planted in the soil, fertile soil, that your heart would say, God, I want to receive every word that falls from the seeds that fall from that stage, from the seeds that fall from my devotional time. When I open my Bible, I want the seeds to fall on good soil in my heart. 
Lord, I want my heart to be free from the hardness and anger and frustration and complacency. Any spiritual thing that's trying to attack the growth in my life this year, Lord, I surrender. With heads bowed, eyes closed, if you're here today and you say, that's me, this word was for me. I want to produce much fruit and I need God to do some work in my heart and my life. I want you to raise your hand up all over this room. God's talking to you. The gardener is in the room. And don't be afraid. He's not trying to rob you of your life. He's not trying to take anything from your life. He wants to cause you to flourish this year, to thrive. If you raised your hand or you just need to get to the altar today, would you leave your seat? Come and join me at this altar. We're just going to take a couple minutes right now to just surrender, to solidify at the start of the year, this final weekend of January, to say, God, I am getting planted in your house with your people, connected in your purpose, with your word. God, I'm getting my heart ready to receive receive every seed that comes forth from this ministry. God, I want you to produce in me a harvest 30, 60, 100 fold. Peace, joy, love, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, God, self-control, prosperity this year, God. Grow me to be the man you've called me to be. Grow me to be the woman you've called me. God, grow us, our family, our marriage, our house, whatever it is. If you want to come down to the altar with your family, with your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, your friends, come and join us today. Lamar, would you lead us in that song? Let's just worship God all over this place. Just surrender to Him. Just lift your hands to Him and say, God, I give you my heart. God, I give you my life. Lord, I ask you to work in me. Lord, I ask you to show me. God, to praise you, to trust you, to let you work in me, to let you mold me, to let you prune me, God, so that I can produce much fruit. He's with you. He's for you. He's for you. Let's sing that song, I will build my life upon your love. And I will build my life. Come on, this is your year to say, Lord, I'm going to build on your love. I'm going to build in your house. I'm going to let my roots sink down deep. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to lean not to my own understanding. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to release hurts and wounds. I'm going to walk in the authority that you've called me to walk in. I'm going to walk in the victory you called me to walk in. Lord, I need you. Holy Spirit, I need you. God, I need your grace. I need your mercy. Lord, I'm trusting in you. Lord, give her the mind of Christ. Lord, I thank you that you love her. You forgive her. Lord, you're with her. You're walking.
He's a good, good father. He loves you. He prunes who he loves. He corrects who he loves. I was asking someone recently, when's the best time to prune a tree? And they said, right now, in the dead of winter, January is the perfect month to lay aside every weight, every hindrance, every wound, every hurt, to let him have the full work. Godly sorrow produces good repentance, salvation without regret. This is a great time to just say, Lord, have your way. That's why that victory story, that video of Jared and and the crew just throwing things into the fire is so, so beautiful. It's just saying, Lord, have your way because this year I want to grow. This year I want to develop into who you've called me to be. As I was praying down at the altar, I just felt like the Lord was saying to some of you that are single, God says, there's a reason why you didn't end up with that person. God says, I was looking out for you. You thought this was a massive disappointment, a big time miss, but God says this this was the mercy of God delivering you. God says, I I have the right one for you. I've got the right future for you. Trust me. He's a gardener. He's a good gardener. He can even take your mistakes and say, with that, I'm going to do some trimming, but I'm going to produce in you a beautiful testimony. You're going to be one of the greatest testimonies, like Paul the Apostle. He came out of a really bad past, but man, he was used for God to do some great things. God's going to do something great through you. And I just hear the Lord say, I've been pruning you to promote you. I've been preparing you for producing much fruit this year. He loves you. He's with you. And his mercies are new. God, I just thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new this morning, God. Thank you for your goodness, your grace. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, great is your faithfulness to us. God, I thank you, Lord, this year that you would, God, just make it a year, Lord, that you rain out your favor on this church, God, that you just give a harvest on the other side of all the plowing, the seeds, the sowing, of tears, the pruning, God, that this is a year to produce much fruit. Someone told me that we're supposed to have an early spring this year. They said, I've been looking at the farmer's almanac and I've been studying the climate and the weather and we're supposed to have an early spring. I said, what does that mean? They said, winter is ending sooner than you realize. And I just heard that in the spirit for somebody. Winter is ending sooner than you realize. You don't have to be afraid. God's about to grow you. He's about to produce so many beautiful, green, lush, just like my mom's tree that just exploded and and just went beyond what we ever thought it could look like after it had been trimmed down so much. God says, get ready, get ready. Lord, I just thank you that this year, God, we would experience more of your joy, your peace, your grace, your mercy, your love flowing in us and through us. Just say this with me, Jesus, I surrender. Your will, not my will. I receive your mercy, your grace. You're my Lord, my Savior, and I'm all yours. I repent of sin. And Lord, today, I'm planted in your house, in your word, with your people. And I trust you with all the pruning that I will produce much fruit. This year, I will flourish in your house. I will grow strong. I'm all yours, God. In Jesus' name, amen.